Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Laszlo, Pierre, dear friends, Bernadette, thank you very much for the organization of this timely conference. You have uh, already heard a lot of things, and uh, in addition to what uh, was said by the ILO and the IMF, by my colleague of the European Parliament, by Pierre and uh, Laszlo, I want uh, to add something from my point of view to address uh, tonight the issue of jobs and growth. <coughs> I share entirely the view of Pierre Moscovici. Moscovici, without growth, we will never get stability in the European Union. Without employment, Europe will fail. I would like to reflect with you on the threat posed by rising inequality to our economy and to our democracy. Dear friends, in the past, inequality was mostly seen as a moral dilemma. And for me, it is still a moral dilemma. Achieving social justice is one of the most fundamental goals of politics. But in our days, more and more people are also waking up to the tremendous economic problems caused by rising inequality. Not least due to Thomas Piketty's monumental book on capital, in German, Kapital, sounds very nice. <laughs> or the recent Bertelsmann study you mentioned, uh, Laszlo, which shows that, I quote, social injustice has once again clearly increased in recent years, most obviously in the crisis better southern European countries, end of the quote. The study attributes to the rigid austerity that has undermined social systems and concludes that a highly explosive situation has emerged with the European Union to the point where it might endanger the whole European Union, the whole European project. And let's not forget the stern warning the World Economic Forum made earlier this year. I quote, the chronic gap between the incomes of the richest and poorest citizens <coughs> is the risk that is most likely to cause serious damage globally in the coming decade. End of the quote. Ladies and gentlemen, if the World Economic Forum is saying inequality has become a threat, we must, in be, we must indeed be in trouble. The European Parliament has stressed over and over again the decent, the decent jobs and wages are important not only for social <coughs> cohesion and fairness, but for maintaining a strong economy. We, my colleagues in the European Parliament, we have been pointing out that in fact social and economic priorities are not contradictory but deeply interdependent. On the same line, sustainable budget and investment must be two sides of the same coin. Of course, we need to return to sustainable budgets. We cannot live that today at the cost of our children. But not living at the cost of our children also includes not making short-sighted cuts in areas where long-term negative effects will result in education, in research, and in development, in healthcare, and a long list of other items. In these areas we need more not less investments. This is about investing in social inclusion and economic <coughs> prosperity. This is about building bridges to the future. Please allow me to highlight three issues that are especially salient both in terms of social justice and economic prosperity. My first point, and I spoke during the election campaign permanently about that, and by the way, Jean-Claude Juncker, 
as well. And as you mentioned, uh, the European elections, uh, we invented a new method to put the Commission on the road. And therefore, we will verify very intensively all during the hearings proposals of the commissioners and that it is the European Parliament which is deciding about the president of the European Commission in my eyes is a big democratic achievement I have fought a lot for it's a pity now that another one has the profit of it but uh, <laughs> nevertheless it was a step forward <coughs> My first point is youth unemployment. During the crisis, youth unemployment has climbed to ever new highs. More than 20%, ladies and gentlemen, 20% of young Europeans wanting to work cannot find a job. Some countries, you know it, like Spain, Greece, Italy, are hit particularly hard with one in two young people unemployed. Many more are stuck in precarious works or internships. Yes, young people have always been at a higher risk of unemployment than adults. The transition from school, school or university to the first job has always been a difficult moment. But the crisis has made this transition worse, much worse. And that's really unfair. Because today young people are paying with their life chances for a crisis they have not caused. Now the social divide between generations is widening. This inequality is threatening the social fabric of our societies. The trust that our democracies are fair and just. The belief that with hard work and a good education you can make it. This is put in doubt by a lot of people. And this is a doubt, not only to fairness and justice in our society, it is a doubt about democracy. Let's not forget that youth unemployment also damages the economy and costs a lot of money. In the short term, the state has to pay social benefits. In the long term, youth unemployment means lower wages, <coughs> lower career chances, lower productivity, money lost to the state and to businesses. So why not take some of the money we are currently losing due to youth unemployment? The cost has been put by Eurofound at 153 billion euros per year. That is 1.2% of the EU's GDP. Why not take a percentage of this money to create new chances for young people and invest in their future? I'm convinced, ladies and gentlemen, that it is better to pay for putting young people back in jobs than paying for them to stay at home. And I'm proud that the European Parliament has spearheaded the movement for the creation of the 8 billion euro for the youth guarantee. Now, I hope, every young person is given a job or a professional training within four months after ending their education. And we pushed for the so-called front-loading of the funds. Means nothing else than to anticipate the spending of the foreseen 8 billion euros in the multi-annual financial framework of the European Union between 2014 and 2020 to front load the money because honestly spoken what good does money spend in 2020 to fight unemployment today and uh, because Pierre spoke about the European Council, what it costs a pressure from the Parliament of the Council to agree with that front-loading. I will not explain tonight to you because uh, I want to continue with you in a serious and quiet frame. 
but uh, listening to heads of states and government telling us that they have not the money available in 2014 or 15 to fight against youth unemployment and that we have to postpone the spending to 2020 by budgetary reason is honestly speaking a shame. A lot remains to be done as it turns out that some member states fail to take full advantage of scheme. Not to mention the fact that the funds allocated to the program are still far below the 21 billion recommended by the International Labour Organization. During this legislature we will keep up the fight and we must keep up the fight. We will fight for an effective and swift implementation of the program for the fight against youth unemployment, for more money and for opening the youth guarantee to more people. Youth unemployment is the biggest challenge facing Europe today and must be our top priority. It's not only banks who are too big to fail, surely our children's future are too big to fail. My second point, income inequality. Income inequality has many faces. It's the worker who puts in 40 hours every week and still can't live off his paycheck. The number of working poor is now at a shocking 9% in the European Union, 9%. It must be that one cornerstone of a social market economy is that everyone in work must be able to earn a living wage. Income inequality is also the women who earns less than her male colleague doing the same job. The gender pay gap is growing injustice in the 21st century. The next commission must address it fervently. Ladies and gentlemen, income inequality is the Romanian butcher slaving away for three euros per hour wages in a German slaughterhouse. This kind of wage dumping is undermining the social system of our European societies. <coughs> and there is only one solution for this, a system of European minimum wages. And above all, income inequality is the fact that in recent years, top incomes have grown much faster than incomes of the rest of the society. That's not fair, but other than not being fair, it is also an economic problem. Say a CAO earns 100 times more than the company's average worker. But will the CEO buy 100 times more meals and have 100 times more haircuts and buy for me, for sure not, and buy 100 more times more cars. Okay, he or she might go for luxury products, but still, how many lobsters can one person eat? I know I'm oversimplifying, but there is a fundamental truth here. Stagnating incomes equals stagnating demand and stagnating demand equals stagnating growth and allowing for less growth is the last thing we can afford in Europe at the moment so to get out of the crisis we need to add something that is missing in today's economic policy toolbox stimulating demand by increasing wages because higher wages brings higher demand, which equals more hiring, which in turn increases wages, a circle which increases prosperity for all. Yes, decent salaries are <coughs> crucial for maintaining a strong economy. A starting point is without doubt the introduction 
of minimum wages. Jean-Claude Juncker has declared in front of the European Parliament that he would work towards the introduction of a minimum wage in each EU country. The Parliament looks forward to what the Commission will propose in this field. Additionally, some core countries could increase wages as one way of increasing spending to stimulate growth. And uh, I'm the representative of uh, one of these uh, countries in the European Parliament, which plays a key role in stimulating growth. And therefore, Germany has a leading role Yes, but Germany has also to have a leading role in increasing wages to stimulate demand in the European Union. As my last point, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to address the scandal of tax fraud and tax avoidance. And I'm absolutely in agreement with the president of the European, designated of the European Commission in the fight against tax fraud and tax avoidance. I was very happy that Pierre will deal with the item because we worked during the last years a lot to increase attention to this underestimated problem, not only in Europe, worldwide. Ladies and gentlemen, according to estimates, 1 trillion euros is lost every year only in the European Union due to tax fraud and tax avoidance. I repeat the figure, 1 trillion euros. This is 2,000 euros per citizen every year. With that money, we could pay off our sovereign debt within a decade. But tax fraud and tax avoidance cuts deeper than only a monetary loss. How do you explain to a family company who are honestly paying their taxes that big multinational corporations like Amazon, Google and Apple are paying almost zero in taxes? How do you explain to people who have been suffering from wages reductions and pension cuts that their rich compatriots are hiding money in Swiss bank accounts? How do you explain to normal <coughs> citizens that European countries are engaging in tax dumping to lure companies towards them instead of standing side by side and making all companies pay their fair share in taxes? Well. You can't really explain these things to anybody because tax avoidance and tax fraud fly in the face of fairness. Tax fraud undermines solidarity between countries and solidarity within countries. No one is enthusiastic about paying taxes, but most people recognize their responsibility towards the society. But this acceptance depends on tax justice. The decisions taken by the finance minister in Kern, Australia, over the weekend to fight corporate tax evasion is a step in the right direction. For once, the G20 are actually following up on something they promised. We will closely monitor the implementation of those recommendations and push for further steps to follow, because there is still plenty of work to do. And I add the John Claude Juncker took in his declaration in front of the European Parliament on the 15th of July in his speech on board an element I suggested as his counterpart in the election campaign. The principle which brings more fairness and justice to the tax system in, European, in the European Union. Ordinary citizens Owners of small and, business and medium enterprises here in Brussels, for example, have to pay their taxes here. Would be nice if an employee or worker here in Brussels could say, 
give me my salary, but I pay my taxes in Luxembourg. <laughs> Would be nice if a small and medium enterprise could say, yes, the haircutter here downstairs in the hotel. I have my income here, but I pay my taxes in the Cayman Islands. No. 99% of 98, 98% of citizens pay their taxes there where they are living. Why worldwide acting companies don't pay their taxes where they make their profits? To introduce a simple principle in the European Union, I was happy that Juncker took it. The country of the profit is the country of the tax. Is to introduce fairness and justice between citizens and companies. There, where you have your profit, you pay your tax. And if Google makes in Germany several billion euros profit and they pay no single euro taxes because the seat of the company is I don't know on which island. <laughs> Why we cannot introduce the principle the part of the profit of Google or Amazon or another company made in Germany has to be shown and is then taxed in Germany or in France or in another country. Social policy is primarily the responsibility of national governments, but I believe the European Union can and must play an important role in fighting inequality on several levels. So far, the EU has focused on moving towards a deeper integration of fiscal and economic policies while ignoring the social dimension of the European Monetary Union peer and Laszlo have spoken about that. Yet, even in social policy, we are so interdependent. What happens in one country affects another country. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, it is high time for the European Union to show that it is protecting its citizens and flesh out the social dimension. If we address inequality, we stand a fair chance of automatically stimulating growth and creating jobs on the way. It is high time to fight against inequality because inequality is not only damaging our economy, it is undermining the security of our democracies. And therefore, Europe as it crossroads, this is the item of your debate, means to fight against inequality. Thank you very much.